so what I thought we could do uh, is just to start of just to ask the two of them to perhaps make uh, some general comments about the social, political, uh, pedagogical uh, uh, theories of, uh, of, uh, of, of Neville and then to perhaps raise some points that they think we need to uh, think about as we enter into the conference and the papers that will be uh, delivered uh, over the next uh, two days. And then after that, perhaps to invite a few people to make some comments or to ask some additional questions. Okay, so. Thank you very much, Ivor. Well, the first thing I want to say, of course, is that there are a number of people I'm looking at who actually worked with Neville. And of course, it might have been better to ask them to speak. <laughs> and they're right here, they're, they're in the movie, and they are here. So we are privileged to have people who actually worked in the same place as Neville, developed some of his ideas, helped him to develop his ideas, uh, especially on the language and literacy issue. But there are three things I want to point to based on the film. Because, you know, Neville's life, you could speak about it for a very long time, productively, very usefully. But there are just three things that, in the five minutes I was given to me, uh, that I want to point to. The first is the extraordinary fact that Neville, uh, who openly proclaimed his Marxism, his background, his political uh, upbringing in a Trotsky's movement, uh, was never sectarian. In other words, he uh, was willing to talk to, uh, it's a habit which very few people uh, who are major political figures uh, have been able to adopt like Neville did. He was able to speak across the political divide, uh, although it was very clear what his own standpoint was. So nothing prevented him from engaging with people uh, in the Communist Party, in the ANC, in the BC movement, because his whole life was dedicated to advancing a set of ideas with a set of practices. And it didn't really matter uh, what your political color was, uh, as long as you were prepared to uh, advance a set of ideas and practices which had to do with social justice uh, and with uh, uh, dealing with the most difficult issues in our society. It's the thing which remains important because uh, history is being rewritten at the moment in ways which suggest that there is only one political tradition in this country. And it's a dangerous way of presenting history, of writing it, because it shuts out all other possibilities. It shuts out the wonder of our broad uh, democratic tradition in this country, in the liberation movement. Uh, and most of all, it shuts out the possibility of speaking with each other across the political spectrum so that we could share. I don't think anybody should be as arrogant as to suggest that only them and their political brand of ideas has the solutions to the problems of a complex society like ours. That's the first point, Neville's non-sectarianism, despite the fact that he was very clearly a socialist, very clearly a Marxist, very clearly not associated with the forms of socialism which uh, were Stalinist, very clearly, all of that but it didn't prevent him. The second thing is the extraordinary perceptiveness 
of his work on the issue of race and racism. I honestly urge all of those who haven't read his writing on this to read it. To read particularly his book, One Azania, One Nation. It was written in 1977, 78, 79, I think. We all copied it in the underground, photostat because it was banned immediately. In fact, he wrote it under a, uh, a nomdi plume. You know, he wrote it under the name Nosizwe, uh, uh, precisely because uh, he could not uh, write it uh, in any other way. But we, and it was banned. Um, and it was banned because uh, the regime of the time feared the power of the ideas that were contained in it. What was the central idea? The central idea in his book was that the apartheid ways of describing ourselves in our society are pernicious, dangerous, and explosive. That at the end of the day, if we continued to name ourselves in the racist categories, which we had imbibed, which all of us had imbibed historically, we ourselves were guilty of it, but if we continued to describe ourselves in that way, we are heading, and I have heard Neville say this more than once, we are heading for a genocide. And he uses Rwanda as an example. Now this is very often confused with the idea, it's confused with the problem of trying to affirm that part of our society which has been historically exploited and oppressed. But there is profound confusion between continuing to use the categories of apartheid and this important issue of social justice. Whether you have to continue to use the racial categories of apartheid to achieve social justice, it's very clear from Neville's thinking that you don't have to do that. You don't have to use the master's tools to try and break down the master's house that somebody else said. There are many ways of thinking about social justice issues substantively, in the real way, not in these false ways in which it is now being uh, used precisely to enrich a new elite and to create the kind of new social classes which uh, the use the particular use of race and racist labels uh, uh, permits. I think the third issue that comes out for me in the life of Neville and in this movie, uh, in this documentary, is simply this, that it is possible always to do something, to be active, to translate ideas into practices, in little ways, in big ways, that struggling to achieve conceptual, theoretical clarity is not enough. You have to go beyond that. You have to go beyond these academic exercises. They are very important, clarifying in your mind, through your practice, exactly what it is, but you have to translate that into some or other form of action. And there are many ways of being active because it's obvious that today we have, many of us, have become so um, dispirited by what has happened is that we have been almost paralyzed, almost. <clears throat> but it's not true that we are really paralyzed. You simply have to rethink about what we have done in our history. The great many actions, the bravery, the courage, the ability to mobilize, the ability to take ideas into communities, with communities, assist 
uh, in clarifying our ideas through action. And this is what, in relation particularly in the last so many years of Neville's life, he used the issue of language and education precisely for the purposes of engaging in the realm of ideas through the process of action. So for him, reflection and action were inseparable. Theory and practice were not separate things. They had to be done simultaneously. The one built the other. And that for me is a profound lesson. And when, he, when the, 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 the documentary started, which is my last point, he said, if you have no vision, um, you are in danger uh, of, uh, perishing. of yeah. perishing. This is an extremely important idea. There are, there's an adjunct to that. Is if you don't have a vision, you will invariably be carrying out somebody else's vision. Because there are very strong forces in our society which are intent and demand that theirs is the only way. And at, as you can see, as, uh, as you could see towards the end of the, mov the movie, the documentary, global corporate capitalism and its extraordinary power to shape the vision of the whole of society, the whole world, that's what it's doing even now. While we sit in little groups, it's just doing that in every aspect of our lives. That's the vision which is dominant, it is hegemonic, it is taking the world into this perilous uh, abyss of global poverty, global separation, global racism. That's what it's doing. And his calling on us to have a vision is uh, really to say, let's think about these things in ways which are socially meaningful for all of us and let's act on those ideas. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start by telling a little story because it's, it's always good to. Um, Neville, in, um, in the 80s, you should tell me about the conversations he had with Madiba when he was on Robben Island, and particularly on the national question, and how eventually he, they both decided that this wasn't, you know, a debate that was going to end, and so they agreed to disagree. And, and, and what Neville would say was, you know, Madiba would say, well, look, there are four nations. There's the African, the colored, the Indian, and the white. And many years later, I had the privilege of working for Madiba uh, to help set up the Nelson Mandela Foundation. And in one of my earlier meetings with him, talking about staffing at the foundation, Madiba said to me, well, look, John, you must always make sure that on the staff we have the minorities. And so I thought back to what Neville had said about the national question and how, but the reason I mentioned the story, in fact, is, is how Neville um, considered it very important that we find other ways, uh, in fact, a new language to begin talking about ourselves in this country that the current discourse that we have available to us is fabulous. And in fact, a couple of years ago, he threw the gauntlet down at UCT and said to them, why do we still have to have the requirements of describing our students as colored, white, Indian, and African? That as a university, are there other ways we can describe our students? And this is a very, very powerful idea. And I suspect that what Neville understood and, and why 
he uh, took the position of encouraging and in fact of articulating very strongly the need for African languages to be used more powerfully in our daily lives was that there was an inher inherent failure in English and Afrikaans. And so to break away out of that prison, one had to almost find another language that we could begin to use in ways that would get us out of this historical trap. Um, and I know we've had, we had a number of discussions about this. And so it is, I think, at the heart of this issue that if we are going to be able to break out of this prison, then we have to find a new language that will give us the imagination to begin to talk about ourselves in different ways. Because for as long as we paint ourselves in these four categories, in fact, we will limit our possibilities as a nation. The imagination of a new South Africa will not come about because we limit that possibility. Um, the other point that came through, in fact, in, 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 in the documentary, uh, Neville's constant referring back to education. And it is, I, I've been fascinated by, by this particular point because I've been reading um, a, a lot about the life of Gramsci, who also was a political prisoner. And in, in prison, he spent a lot of time thinking about education both the education of children and the education of adults. And, uh, and I don't think it's an accident. I, d I don't think that this, this concern, this, this return, this constant return to education is accidental. And I know this at first hand because ne uh, Enver and I had the privilege of working with Neville in the 80s. And perhaps the 80s could be described in this country as, as one of the most repressive periods that we experienced in the struggle against apartheid. And it was during this period that we were seized with the issue of what do you do and what can you do in education. Now there was a whole series of things. There were lots of young people who no longer could go to school. There were lots of young people who missed educational opportunities. There were lots of young people who said they didn't want to participate in an inferior ed education. And so we worked in an organization that attempted to deal with both the, um, the young people who um, were excluded by the apartheid educational system, as well as young people who wanted to break away. And so one of the uh, institutions that we launched in the 80s was called Kanya College. And Kanya College essentially gave young students the opportunity to get into university. Um, and, and for a whole range of reasons, they didn't meet the required point system that the university needed in those days. And so they spent one year at Kanya College. And it was during this time, as we thought about and, and, and implemented Kanya College, that this whole debate about what was possible, that even within the constraints of a repressive system, there were possibilities. And we constantly, at Kanya College, pushed those boundaries, in fact. And so, long before many mainstream universities taught African literature and African history, we taught a university course in African literature and African history at Kanya College. Neville authored the first uh, course on African history that went from year zero to the post-independence period of Africa. And that course reached 
over 250,000 people every week. It was carried in the Sunday newspaper, the Post, and every week we knew that over 250,000 people read, read this, and this was in the 80s. So, the point that I'm getting at here, in fact, is didn't, that... Didn't prevent them from banning every... Well, that's the thing. Uh, you know, when they eventually realized what was going on, then they banned the, the, the newspaper. But the point that I'm getting at here is, is, is the notion, in fact, that we don't have to be paralyzed. That, that there are possibilities. And Neville spent an enormous amount of his time and energy in thinking about that. And so, for example, the reading clubs, which is an extremely simple, but also highly, and, and, a, and a very powerful idea. And I remember when, when, um, when I uh, worked at, at, at the University of the Free State, I mean, one of the discussions I had with Neville was how one could begin, in fact, to look at reading clubs as a movement in the country. That, take for example, if we wanted to inject um, a, a new spirit in our student movement in this country, if we had 10,000 university students right, running 10,000 reading clubs across the country. Now, here's a very, very simple idea, but the power of that, in fact, the power of having a child read that is a revolutionary act. The, you know, the power of a child having the capacity to read, you know, is, is, is a liberatory act. And so, contained within a very simple idea is this extremely powerful notion. And, uh, the freeing up of the mind. And, and, and this is, in fact, I think, what Neville saw in the whole notion of reading clubs across the country. And so this, this notion about paying attention to education, and, and I don't think it was an accident that the metaphor of the University of, of Life on Robben Island happened. Uh, because as Enver said, the the power, in fact, of capitalist ideology today, we, we have become entrapped in, in, in many different ways, in the way we think, the way we look at things, and so on. And, and so, we don't have, in fact, I mean, and, and this is one of the failings, I think, of the radical intellectuals of this country. We don't have an alternative vision to give to the next generation. I, I really think this is, this really is a huge um, tragedy that we need, in fact, to leave to the next generation a hopeful vision, a vision that thinks that the world doesn't have to stay the same, that that things can in fact change. And that is where Neville inspired so many people. He inspired them because despite, despite all the conditions, despite all the opposition, despite all the uh, contradictions, Neville held out that possibility that it may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, but it, one thing, he was certain it would happen. Change will happen. But in order for us to support that, I think it's very important that the intellectuals of a radical tradition leave a hopeful vision for the next generation. Thank you. Okay. Um, Iva, sorry. Can I just say to people, there are people here who are actually involved in reading clubs. 
I think it's very important to recognize that. Um, and so that those who are interested in this should speak with them. Can you please stand up, all of you who are involved in reading clubs, so, that, so we know who you are? Please, please, let's... This is part of the work of... Yeah, you see? So here they are. It's not as though we're talking of something in the abstract. There are people right here who are doing this. Thank you very much. Thanks. or comment. Question, Ivor. Can it be a comment? Comment. Comment. Comment.
And one thing for sure that I learned from him that if you want to be the change that you want to see in the world, first, even yourself, there are things that you have to compromise in life. And you can see committed what we call class suicide because he, he made his own choices. And that's one thing that uh, I've copied from him. And those are the things that he will always stick with me. And that's why even when I was presenting this afternoon, when one of my colleagues said, are you available to come and work with me in the free state? And I said, free state should come to me. Because I felt there is no need for all of us here as young people to go and rush. Uh, to better places, whereas where we grew up, we have never swept, and it's still we still have to do quite a number of things that we have to do. We have to embark on popular education. We have to work with our teachers. We have to work with our learners. We have to instill a sense of pride in our own language, because our children they struggle to read the instructions. Our free teaching practice at intermediate phase because we're going to move our program now to intermediate phase. And when the child is going to take a, 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 that particular learner almost 20 minutes just to read the question and understand the question, what it means, then it, the moment she has to write, she does, is not even sure what she's writing. And you get this attitude when you, when you speak to the, the, the people that you are in the education fraternity and they're supposed to to, to have a clue of how to change the status quo. And they say, there's no way that our children can learn in the mother tongue. What, why are we doing this to, to children? And what type of society are going to grow up and become? They are supposed to learn English. English is the language of discourse. Yes, it's the language of discourse. Because if a number is expressed in English, God abandoned a baby to the moment he pushing people as about the balloon won't be. Because it's not a baby. We two hours of one hour for five minutes is for instruction. Nothing else. And even from there, she cannot translate it. I really, I felt it was robbed us. Because in many of the, the things that I read about him, the autobiography, he quoted also some, some of the verses from the Bible. But I felt it was not us that ended It was too soon because now some of us, this is an I'm I'm so glad that I managed to get in touch with him and then we'll carry the then. confidence first 
to the majority of other people that, that don't really believe in this alternative way of, 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 of teaching, in accepting that, I mean, the, the mother tongue is the way to go. I mean, if you can really now make a practical sense, if you can begin to set a question paper, I mean, China, the, the Chinese nation has done that, translated maths into their language, translated a lot, a lot of other things in their own language. And you can begin to see that there's great change. So if you can begin to, to, to set the question paper in, in, in this course, and track, look how that child will begin to perform. You see, it, it, that, that child will perform great, there will be a difference in terms of performance. So how do you begin to really make people to believe that this is an alternative way of doing things and it's a better way of doing things? Because really the majority of black child is suffering under this uh, dominant language. <coughs>
is so much free that one would want to sit with him and maybe perhaps maybe rub off <laughs> some of uh, what he's doing. Um, exactly as my brother is saying, I had the privilege of growing up in a rural place I was not saying that, so I know how to speak of the Kanaan and Mori and I've been around the same area, the area uh, Victoria, Durban. So I know how to speak to Allah, Sisu, and Sisu. Uh, but there is a thin line exactly, um, especially with the natives, uh, that is like in Bunina Mishiki. Um, there's this cultural barrier that I actually um, sort of like contributing to us as being so much socially divided. Um, I think we need to really find some way of actually bringing all those cultures together. As Nabil is saying, we need to have one unifying language that is going to sort of like transcend over all these uh, barriers that we've got uh, within our, our, our nation. Uh, and we've got a beautiful nation. Okay, now the hands are going.
sometimes when you go to the reading club and you, you were, of course, thinking that you, you didn't want to go, but you push yourself to go. And when you get there at the reading club, you find that the children are standing there and it's raining and they're waiting. So um, it became one of those things that drove us to go and work with the children and educate the children. And for him to show us that you have to walk the talk. It's not just ideas that are flowing, that people keep discussing and now implementing. You have to go and show us that this is how we do it for them to start becoming inspired to say, I can also do it if he can do it. So I think those are the things that I can do. I 
you. I learned a lot. I've got two points to make. One, conference of this nature is very rare for us. So it's, I would like to say thank you first to NLU to, to give us the platform. Because really we need such platforms so that we can, ex can, can there's a lot of contradictions, especially yeah. in this country, especially for the past five years. Although, you see, a lot of people want to say something, but you know, there is that fear, you understand? I hope this, this engagement will continue, won't just end today, we'll have more engagement so that we can get to know each other and do practical things so that we can help each other also to our communities. So, the things that I want to say. Okay, um, the one was from Anele. Anele, there are people in this room uh, who are teaching mathematics in his class. That includes uh, uh, Nobuntu there, and Sistoli, you are also doing it, I'm, I think. And maybe there are people here. So perhaps one, you should have a discussion at some stage. And really what they are also doing is trying to help teachers to understand how to do that. And the place where never work, Price, are they've developed materials to do this exactly, teach in, teach mathematics and science, by the way. In fact, there's a, there's a movie, there's a documentary which they produced showing a teacher in Langa, or is it Google uh, teaching a mathematics class on fractions, you remember? in this thought. So that is, and it's a question of our spreading these possibilities, getting more and more people. Yes, teachers are very skeptical. They've been trained in this way. They think it's not possible to do that. No, no, it's absolutely possible to do these things. And we have to uh, be much more imaginative. And of course, we have to propagate these ideas and get people to understand that it's entirely possible. And there's all these people who are doing it are sitting in this very room looking at me at this moment. Uh, and I might be misrepresenting what they do because they know it better. The second point is, that my dear friend, comrade, asked the question about how did Neville... Neville used to always say, enough is as good as a feast. So I think he just simply decided, you know, that look, enough is okay, you don't have to have, and that's why he lived this simple life, uh, and he pursued it, and he made the decision. I don't think it was, well, I suspect being in prison for 10 years <laughs> might have helped a bit, <laughs> but, but uh, anyway, he made that decision, and that's how it was, and it's not difficult, really, for him, it wasn't difficult. Uh, I think, you, you, you know, it's possible to make those commitments. Um, no, and the rest were just wonderful contributions from all of you. Really, uh, thank you very much for reflecting on how uh, Neville uh, and his work and life affects you. I just hope you take it forward. You know, you have to, we have to, there, we have to find ways of continuing. In fact, at the end of the conference, John was going to talk about that, about how we intend continuing to take forward some of these issues in practical ways. We'll do that. We'll talk about that. Just, um, I, I, I think <clears throat> listening to all the contributions added another dimension to, to our understanding of level that. So <clears throat> I'm, we, we're grateful for that. I, one of the um, characteristics in fact that, that may help, help us understand this, this strong determination uh, is um, located, I think, in uh, a kind of self-discipline uh, that starts not later on in life. And, and here, in fact, I, I mentioned earlier on Gramsci, the Italian, uh, who um, was put, put into prison primarily because of his idea. Right? And Mussolini, who was then uh, heading up uh, Italy, said, I want this mind 
didn't say Gramsci, I want this mind in person, right? And, and one of his, his reflections on, on early education, uh, where he talks about just the discipline of sitting down and doing something for an hour, right? You know, it, 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 it's a physical discipline. The ability to sit, concentrate, and do something for an hour. Um, that prepares you mentally for many of the other challenges that come later in life, in fact. And, and Neville always was very, very strong on this aspect that, that uh, you couldn't just come up with ideas without having thought through it carefully, worked it out carefully, and so on. So th there was both a mental, but also a physical discipline, right, that, that involved you in being able to sit for six hours and read something and make sense of it, right? And, and, and that discipline was both the physical, you know, constraining yourself, as well as the intellectual, you know, dealing with the challenges of it. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Edward. I can't let Salim off the hook, so I'm going to ask Salim to close uh, uh, and say and Salim a few words, eh? <laughs> no, I think. The most important things have been said about Neville. Um, I mean, I can imagine him looking at this gathering and uh, thinking, why are you spending so much time talking about me? We go out and organize. We have a revolution to make. We don't have a revolution in our country, and the work is not done yet. Um, and, you know, one of the things is his. Uh, his zest for life. He enjoyed life. He enjoyed people. He would enjoy this gathering. Um, and I know in the early 80s, uh, one of the most <coughs> important things for him was to spend time with young people. He used to come to Johannesburg and whenever he came, he was either in Soweto with us organizing youth group meetings in Alexandria Township, in other townships, uh, in the trade union movement at that time, the new independent trade union movement. Uh, that was very important. Uh, so his enjoyment of people, of life, was key for them. Music, art, literature, and language was part of that. He also enjoyed the richness of humanity. He was interested in other struggles as well. What's happening in Egypt today? I mean, I can imagine Neville listening to the news, finding out what's happening there. Before he came from Germany this last time, uh, he asked us to get him in touch with people from the Middle East to find out about it. And he invited somebody to Germany who talked to his students there. So he was a genuine internationalist. He said, race is skin deep. Humanity is not. The other important point is that, remember, Neville had many things to be bitter about. Robin Island was not a Sunday picnic, especially in the early years. People were treated very, very badly. Um, and it was through struggle on the island, in various ways, that that changed. It didn't come because of the goodness of the heart of the oppressors. Um, but the important thing as well is something John talked about. Discipline. Uh, Neville worked hard. He was up with those people who had the privilege of never <laughs> staying at their houses or living with him knows that he was up very early in the morning working. He worked very hard. 
But for the people in the, the, the audience here, I think the question of youth uh, was key. Uh, the question of discipline was important. He was not sectarian, and he never abstained from struggle. Never abstained from struggle. He used to go house to house. Uh, in the darkest times, uh, uh, he would uh, be involved in communities. Uh, there was always possibilities for struggle. He would never get depressed. He was always optimistic. And I think, I just want to leave you with the last uh, thought, and it's an important uh, point. Many of us try not to talk about certain things which are quite painful. But I think we need to remember this, that Neville's life, even after leaving Robben Island, was under threat on many occasions. Um, that people were sectarian towards him within the liberation movement. I think this is important to remember. In, for example, the place he was born in, in Cradock, those who were assassinated by the apartheid regime, Matthew Gondiwe, Sparrow, etc., were people Neville had study groups with. That was his hometown. They were in the ANC. Neville was not, but they were comrades in arms. The families of those people invited Neville to come to the funeral. He went there, but it was sectarians there, people who are now big businessmen, people who are the elite, people like the Kunenis who eat uh, uh, sushi, you know, disgusting, obscene things like that while our people are still struggling, struggling, while we are the most unequal country in the world, those were the kind of people who threatened Neville's life. So let's not also gloss over that fact. Sometimes we tend not to talk about this. Neville wanted a united front. He was keen on that. He talked about a PLO kind of arrangement. And I think we need to remember that and take a leaf out of his book, The Best Memory. Neville wasn't interested in monuments or anything like that. The best monument for Neville is for us to study his example, his writings, his analysis, in order for us to finish what he called an unfinished revolution. Thank you.